Hello students and today we'll be talking about the second half of the autonomic nervous system known as the SANS or sympathetic autonomic nervous system. And we can see here that I am a crazy cat lady and these little kitties are looking to fight. They are not choosing flight. And the primary neurotransmitter that's used in the SANS is norepinephrine. And of course, others are used as well, including epinephrine, which is released by the adrenal medulla. The medulla means the middle of the adrenal gland, which sits on top of our kidneys. And also dopamine, which is in our brain, our spleen, and our kidneys. Now these neurotransmitters are referred to as endogenous catecholamines. The term endogenous refers or means it originates from within an organism. The term catecholamine refers to neurotransmitters chemical structure. So norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine are specific chemicals that are made by our body. There are other chemicals like the epinephrine in a local anesthesia cartridge and isoproterenol that have similar chemical structures. So they are catecholamines, but these chemicals are manufactured outside of our body or exogenously. So the receptors within the sands, there are many of them. So these many receptors, I want you to think about there are a lot of them that have not even been discovered yet. So we're still working on discovering different receptors that work within the sands. Here the book mentions alpha, beta 1, beta 2. Now you know, more current literature supports is an alpha-1, an alpha-2, an alpha-3, a beta-1, a beta-2, a beta-3. So there's lots and lots of different receptors located within the sands. And stimulation of an alpha receptor causes a different response within our body than the stimulation of a beta receptor. So the sands alpha receptors, when you think about alpha receptors, when you stimulate an alpha receptor within the sands, think of vasoconstriction. That's usually the response. We think about these alpha receptors being located within our eyes, our mucous membranes, and smooth muscle. And even smooth muscle, think about our blood vessels as also being smooth muscles and our blood vessels can constrict and dilate. So stimulation within the sands with an alpha receptor results in mydriasis, which is pupil dilation and vasoconstriction. Now let's take a look at the sands beta receptors. So the beta-1 receptors are located on our heart, in our cardiac muscle. Beta-1 stimulation results in an increase in the heart rate and the force of the heart contraction. So when you think about beta-1, we have one heart. So the majority of the receptors on our heart are beta-1 receptors. We also have beta-2 and they're located on the smooth muscle in our lungs and the blood vessels leading to our heart and skeletal muscle. Stimulation of a beta-2 receptor results in relaxation or vasodilation of smooth muscle. So that relaxation of the smooth muscle leads to vasodilation of the blood vessels to our skeletal muscle and vasodilation of our bronchioles. So when I say something like stimulation, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go faster or it's going to go slower. It really depends on the receptor that's being stimulated. 
So when you hear stimulation of an alpha receptor, it's vasoconstriction. Recep uh, stimulation of a beta-2 receptor means vasodilation. And we're going to take a look. Now look at this. I did my ABC spelling review, and I thought I had corrected this. I apologize for these little red stripes underneath the words, because they are actually words. Um, so the drugs that we're going to talk about, and the drugs can either stimulate these alpha or beta receptors, or they can block these alpha and beta receptors within the sands. So the drugs, known as sympathomimetics or adrenergics, work to stimulate the SANS response. So sympathomimetic drugs play an important role in the treatment of anaphylaxis and asthma. They're also added to local anesthetic solutions. They're known as vasoconstrictors, epinephrine and levonorepine, to prolong the action of local anesthetic. So basically, how do these drugs work? And of course, they work in all different ways. You don't really need to know exactly which drug works directly, indirectly, or mixed. But let's just look at them for our own sake. So there, we have some direct acting. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, isoproterenol work directly. They produce their effects directly on the receptor site. We have mixed acting, ephedrine can either stimulate the receptor or it can stimulate the presynaptic axon terminal vesicle to release endogenous norepinephrine. And then indirect, indirect acting agents such as amphetamines stimulate the release of endogenous from within our body norepinephrine. So the pharmacologic effects of these drugs, the effects really depend on their ability to stimulate various receptors. So epinephrine has both alpha vasoconstriction and beta vasodilation activity. Norepinephrine and phenylephrine stimulate primarily alpha receptors. So that would result in some vasoconstriction and isoproterenol acts mainly on beta receptors. So we may get some vasodilation within the lungs with that drug. So the effects of taking or ingesting one of these agents in the, within the central nervous system, we usually see excitation. The cardiovascular effects, usually an increase in heart rate and strength of contraction. The blood pressure usually increases. The eyes will see mydriasis and a decrease in intraocular pressure. Respiratory bronchodilation and saliva will usually be less. We'll have zero stomia. So the uses of sympathomimetic agents to prolong the local anesthetic effect. They vasoconstrict the vessels around where you've injected the local anesthetic solution so that the body cannot take the local anesthetic solution away as quickly. Hemostasis, um, they'll halt the flow of blood in surgical spaces. If you have worked in a dental office, you may have seen epinephrine and pregnant impregnated gingival retraction cord that they pack around a prep before they take an impression so that the tissue was not oozing blood into the impression space. It's also used to treat shock, hypovolemic shock, which is a loss of a lot of blood. They can be used for cardiac arrest, for an asthma attack, anaphylaxis, ADHD, narcolepsy, and also nasal decongestants. Some of the adverse effects of sympathomimetic drugs, you may see some anxiety and some tremors. 
They can also induce cardiac arrhythmias, making that heart beat faster with more force can trigger a cardiac arrhythmia or make you feel like you're having like palpitations. So sometimes these drugs are contraindicated. Sometimes it's a relative contraindication and sometimes it's an absolute. So these drugs shouldn't be used in persons with an uncontrolled hypertension, angina, or hyperthyroidism because some of the drugs stimulate alpha and beta receptors in the heart and would further increase blood pressure and heart rate. So uncontrolled hypertension, the person has a really out of control blood pressure. We don't want to give them a drug that may cause more vasoconstriction. If they have angina, they're already in a vasoconstrictive state in their coronary arteries and you don't want to lead to more. You can bring on an angina attack. And hyperthyroidism, there's an element to hyperthyroidism when you think about hyperthyroidism your heart is pounding. One of the side effects or effects of being hyperthyroid is your heart is already going very, very fast. And you don't want to add to that increased rate by giving someone a sympathomimetic drug. Now, if we think about this uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled hyperthyroidism, or uncontrolled angina, these are not patients that should be seeking or we should be administering dental hygiene services to anyway. And of course, there is an absolute contraindication between the use of the epinephrine within a local anesthetic cartridge and recent users of cocaine or methamphetamine. So here are some specific sympathomimetic agents we have epinephrine. Epinephrine has both alpha and beta effects. It can result in vasoconstriction and also bronchial dilation. It's the drug of choice for an acute asthmatic attack or anaphylaxis because it aids in that bronchial dilation. The person is struggling to breathe. We want to open up the smooth muscle of the lungs. By dilating, the person is able to get air in. Um, it's also added to local anesthetic cartridges because it vasoconstricts those blood vessels around the site where we've injected the solution. Vasoconstricting those blood vessels results in our body not being able to clear away the local anesthetic solution as fast, making the patient stay numb longer. Phenylephrine, also known as neosinephrine. So you may have heard of neosinephrine. It's kind of like that little bottle that you, when you have a cold, you squirt it up your nose over and over again to try to breathe. It's a decongestant. It has mostly alpha effects, which is vasoconstriction. So it constricts all those swollen vessels up in your nose, as you can just tell I was touching my nose when I was saying that, um, allowing you to breathe better. We also have dopamine, um, which has both alpha and beta. So when I say here the treatment of shock, it's the treatment of shock when someone has lost a lot of blood. And usually when someone has lost a lot of blood, it's from a traumatic accident, a car accident, or something like a stabbing, and they're bleeding. We want to see that vasoconstriction. So first, the blood is not flowing out of the body, right? We want to try to keep the blood within the body. And also, increasing the heart rate and strength of contraction, we want the blood to get up to the heart, right? So the heart's going to work harder to kind of draw that blood up to the heart. So we keep blood going up to our brain. Another drug, albuterol, um, is known as Ventolin is the trade name. So this basically almost exclusively works on the beta-2 receptors that are located in our lungs, causing the smooth muscle within our lungs to relax, to dilate, and breath can get in. Also, we have levonorepine, which works almost exclusively on the alpha receptors, causing vasoconstriction. And some local anesthetics, carbocaine is one of them, you may see 
use levonorepinephrine versus epinephrine as a vasoconstrictor in the cartridge. And we also have ephedrine and pseudoephedrine. They work on both the alpha and the beta. They can be used for nasal congestion, cold, because of their vasoconstriction with the alpha receptors. Um, very rarely, um, it can be, they can be used for asthma because of their stimulation of those beta-2 receptors within our lungs. Ephedrine and pseudoephedrine is what people are cooking up to make methamphetamines. That's why we have to buy Sudafed and the generic versions of Sudafed behind the counter now. You're limited to how much you can buy per month. So now we're going to take a look at drugs. So we just looked at drugs that stimulate or mimic what happens during the SANS response. And now we're going to look at drugs that block or limit that SANS response. So how do these drugs work? Well, they work a lot of different ways. They can block all adrenergic receptors, alpha and beta, or they can block just the alpha or just the beta, or they can even become more specific. They can block just an alpha-1, an alpha-2, a beta-1, or a beta-2. So the more selective the drugs are, the less side effects or the fewer side effects we'll see. So sympatholytics alpha blockers. So we know stimulating the alpha receptors results in vasoconstriction. So when you take a drug that blocks it, it's going to result in vasodilation and an increased blood flow to the skin and organs. So it's useful in treating BPH, which is known as benign prostatic hypertrophy. When men reach 50, it's usually 50 and over, their prostate begins to enlarge and they have difficulty urinating and the flow of urine can be blocked a little bit. So by taking these drugs, they can actually relax the bladder muscles and the urine is able to flow around the enlarged prostate. They can also be used for hypertension, high blood pressure, a condition known as Raynaud syndrome, which is a syndrome when you have, like you go out in the cold and your hands, your extremities turn like white, bluish white. They really react to the cold and you can't get warmth back in your hands. So they're useful in treating that because vasodilates those blood vessels close to the skin. And so that allows the blood to get up close to the surface and keep our extremities warm. The other condition that sympatholytics alpha blockers are used for is a condition of a tumor called a pheochromocytoma. This tumor is usually located or is located within the adrenal medulla and it actually starts to release endogenous catecholamines like epinephrine and things into our bloodstream. And so these sympatholytics block that epinephrine from working on all those receptors and causing things like a heart racing really fast. So sympatholytics beta blockers, now these competitively block the beta receptors in the adrenergic nervous system. And the generic drugs end in OLOL, O-L-O-L. -L. And I'm sure that there is someone here that has seen a patient in the clinic that is taking a Tenolol, trade name Tenorman. So the non-selective drugs produce bradycardia, and they also produce bronchoconstriction. So can you think of a patient subset that this may wreak havoc on? Because if they're also blocking those beta-2 receptors within our lungs, those receptors that allow that vasodilation with stimulation, they block that they can really kind of shut down those lungs, the ability to really 
get your breath in for someone that has asthma or COPD. So these non-selective beta blockers may not work very well for someone with asthma. So we have selective beta blockers. And these selective beta blockers select to work on the beta-1 receptors that are located in our heart, in blood vessels, then on the lungs, producing fewer side effects. So here are some examples of beta blockers. We have that specific or selective atenolol, tenormin, and also our nonspecific or non-selective propranolol, the trade name Indorol. All right, so just remember, if you have a patient or you see someone that has asthma or something with their lungs, a more specific or selective drug, beta blocker, will work better for them than a non-specific. In these beta blockers, alpha, beta 1, beta 2, we are going to talk about at length when we go into the cardiovascular drugs later on in the semester. So, sympatholytic uses, why do we use them? Hypertension, that's why they're used. Slow down the heart, make it so the heart's not contracting so forcefully. They can also be used if someone that has hyperthyroidism that's experiencing that side effect of tachycardia, that really fast heart rate. Severe migraine headaches. So severe migraine headaches can be produced, some headaches are caused by vasodilation, but migraine headaches are produced by a vasoconstriction in our dura mater, and these sympatholytics can actually vasodilate some of those vessels and cause less of a, high, of a migraine headache angina pectoris. Now angina is sort of like a spastic situation or a closing of our coronary arteries on the heart and one of the sympatholytics um, uses is to dilate those arteries on the heart so the person doesn't have that constrictive quality making them have chest pain. They're also used for cardiac arrhythmias Right, they're slowing down the heart. They are decreasing the strength and force of contraction. And also that pheochromocytoma, that adrenal medulla tumor that secretes endogenous catecholamines. And this here is sort of like a little grid of definitely what the sympathomimetics sympatholytics, parasympatholytics, and parasympathomimetics do. And what I like about this is it shows, right, what happens when you mimic the sympathetic nervous system, the SANS, we'll see that increase in blood pressure, pulse rate, relaxing the bronchioles. You also see that when you block the parasympatho the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system of the pans, you get pretty much the same thing happening. So we had talked earlier about when you block a division, inhibit or stop a division, it may feel like the other division is stimulated a little bit because you get the same response. So if you block the pans, for instance, so you block the PANS, and usually when the PANS is active, we'll see meiosis, pupil constriction. So when you block that effect, you'll see pupil dilation, just like when the sympathetic or the SANS is activated. So blocking one division may feel like the other division has been stimulated. And then this here, as I kind of tried to put it all in a little grid, different names, what the drugs are used for, the different drugs to know within each class. 
and also with a little pictogram of what I think of when I think of the group. So I've got the umbrella here because we're drooling. All our fluids are running out of us, so we need an umbrella to block it. And the anticholinergics here, the parasympatholytics dry us all up. It's like the desert, so that's why I have the windmill. The sympathomimetic, mimicking the sands, it's like a dragon here, it's chasing after us, gonna kill us. What happens when we're running in fear? And then what happens when we block that sand? Sympatholytics, we're like a turtle, right? We're just crawling along at our own little pace, relaxing. And then lastly, the neuromuscular blocking drugs. Now these drugs are used during surgery. They're used to essentially paralyze the muscles um, so that you can be intubated. Because if you've ever seen someone with the tube down their throat, the natural instinct is to pull it out, get it out, it's choking us. So these drugs paralyze these muscles, allowing the tube to slip in, you don't gag on it. So how it does it is it affects the transmission between the motor neuro nerve endings and the nicotinic receptors on skeletal muscle. There are two drugs that they use. They use succinylcholine and curar. Succinylcholine attaches to the nicotinic receptor on the muscle. And initially it depolarizes. And that depolarization results in some muscle twitching. It's almost like it goes, like this like little worm brrr, underneath the skin. That's what it looks like. This is quickly followed by paralysis because eventually the receptor can't transmit any further. It can't keep depolarizing. So the sodium channels close and repolarization starts and that's when the muscle becomes paralyzed. Now, curar works a little differently. It blocks the action of acetylcholine, which results in muscle paralysis. In curar, it doesn't have that muscle twitching underneath the skin, and that muscle, that worm-like look underneath the skin can cause people soreness later on after surgery. So if they mix a little curar in with the succinylcholine, that muscle twitching doesn't happen. The person just proceeds into paralysis and they don't have the soreness after the surgery. Succinylcholine, we'll talk about at a later date, has also been linked possibly to something called malignant hyperthermia that runs in families. It's an idiosyncratic reaction. For some reason, when people, it's, it, you, it's like almost like a genetic trait within families. And they don't even know they have it. They go under for surgery. And all of a sudden, every muscle within their body starts contracting over and over again. And this muscle contraction causes a fever. Like your temperature starts going up and up. And this is like a life or death situation when you have malignant hyperthermia. They used to think it could be caused from local anesthetics, but that's been disproven. Um, and we'll learn more about that when we talk about local anesthetics. And there are agents that can reverse the effects um, when someone exhibits signs and symptoms of malignant hypothermia during surgery. Right, so that is our second half of our autonomic nervous system drugs.